So uh, I know I asked a lot about the existentialist stuff and we talked a little bit about post-structuralism and how neither one of us are big fans of that. <laughs> uh, and I saw you had a, I uh, read your recent piece on um, Muslim anarchism. Well, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I remember uh, reading some of the piece that you were responding to and uh, I was, I was impressed that you knew uh, so many of the details about the Quran and well, I, I'm probably the only anarchist who's read the Quran several times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm probably the, the only anarchist who's read the three volumes of Capitals three times. Yeah, I have <laughs> trouble getting through the first. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the third volume is the most interesting, in fact. Um, but, Why? Well, <laughs> Why is that? Well, because it's... Uh, it's more more sociological than than strictly economical, and uh, strangely, uh, Marx uh, gives some small insights about what he thinks the future society could be, and uh, it looks very much like uh, something like uh, a cooperative system, uh, and not at all a state system, uh, and I, I'm surprised that. This aspect of it, his thought is not, not not known, even by Marxists. Well, maybe they don't want to know it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that that's also the volume where he starts to talk a little bit about the state, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and and uh, well, I don't know if you know uh, if you heard about the French specialist of Marx called uh, Maximilien Rubel. Uh, he, he's, he's very famous among Marxists in, in France. Uh, he was a, 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 an unorthodox uh, Marxist, uh, rather counselist, but he, he published uh, a great deal of Marx's works and translated because he spoke German. And uh, I he, 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 had, he wrote in, in the 70s a strange article in which he says that Marx was a theorist of anarchism. Oh, yeah. I, I only heard about that because I saw it, uh, that you mentioned him in one of your essays. Yeah. And when I read that, that essay and by him. The, the problem is the, 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 his argumentation in favor of his thesis is completely, uh, completely strange. You know, he's... Uh, he, he, he misses completely the point. But uh, I interviewed him for Radio Libertaire, the, the radio of the French Anarchist uh, Federation. And uh, I had an interview with him, and I asked him to explain what he wanted to say about that. And he, he, he swept away the question, and he said, uh, that's not interesting. What's interesting now is Proudhon. And in fact, he was... Uh, seem to be ha have become very interested in Proudhon, which is strange for for, for such a man who was a, a, a great specialist of Marx. You know? <laughs> yeah, do uh, is Proudhon read a lot in uh, French anarchist circles these no. days? No, I don't. I don't think so, because uh, well, w when you read Marx, he, his his uh, language. His discourse is uh, is a uh, simple and uh, and very modern. You see, mm -hmm. when you read when you read Proudhon, you immediately realize that he's a 19th century author. And uh, uh, besides that, he's, he he was very fond of polemics. Uh, he took uh, he seemed to have taken a great fun in that. And when he disagreed with somebody. He, uh, he polemized with him and took great pleasure in it. But uh, he, he made polemics with people nobody know anybody today. Right. So, so you've got the tens of tens or hundreds of pages which are absolutely useless uh, to the modern reader, you know. And uh, there's another problem. When, when he uh, challenged the thought of someone, he 
took the, the uh, that person's thought for as as his own and developed it uh, uh, and in the end he he he, uh, he he contradicted it but if you're not attentive uh, you might be tempted to think that's what he re what he really thinks you know while it is the contrary hmm. uh, so he's abs in, in in many ways he, <laughs> he he's absolutely unreadable today uh, unless you make a great effort you know <laughs> so uh well he he needs to be uh, uh de deciphered how do you say uh yeah especially when he's talking about rights or the, the whole concept of right and justice and all these enlightenment uh ideals which sound really ancient today <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Especially if people are used to reading something like Tikkun or uh, the Invisible Committee and all that stuff that uh, the communist or the uh, communization theory stuff. Have you read any of that? No. No. <laughs> no. Maybe I, I know it under another name. I don't know. Um, the Invisible Committee, uh, the what's, Coming what's... Insurrection, is one of the popular works. No, I don't know it, I'm afraid. That's all right. It's uh, There is a trend here in uh, about 20, 2006, probably to 2012, where a lot of people were reading um, the, uh, the works that were coming out by this group called the Invisible Committee, who got... Um, uh, caught up in a, a prosecution of the Tarnak Nine, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Julian Kupat mm -hmm. uh, apparently was accused of um, monkey wrenching or uh, sabotaging the railways. I think. Mm. Oh yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then this famous pundit here on the right uh glenn beck made a, a big deal out of one of the books called the coming insurrection uh saying that this is what the left and communists are trying to do and made a big conspiracy theory out of it and so mm -hmm. it, it increased the sales of that book of course <laughs> yeah it's very much uh, uses the language of Heidegger and other, uh, and then the post structuralists who take after no. Heidegger. I see, which makes it so, so simple to read for ordinary people. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, so you mentioned some of your background in an email to me, and especially where I live, any sort of syndicalist organizing even just regular union organizing is uh pretty rare um i live in a state where unions aren't allowed to automatically take uh dues out of people's paychecks and there's other restrictions that make it really hard to form unions mm -hmm. so um it's definitely a different situation than it sounds like you came out of um so I think, I know I would be really interested in hearing about some of your background and some of the uh, union and syndicalist organizing that, that you're familiar with. Well, I, I've been reading things about Amazon and, and the unions, mm -hmm. and uh, I, 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 I don't know if I really understood, but uh, uh, what I understood is that uh, uh, you have to ask permission to... Uh, to the the workers to create a union, is, is it right or, or is, it, is it? Did I uh, misunderstand? Yeah, you're basically correct. The National Labor Relations Board, which is a government entity, regulates uh, what's considered a legal union, and um, the workers have to win a majority vote. Uh, I, I believe it's held by the National Labor Relations Board uh, mm -hmm. in order to even form the union. Mm. Um, and there's some 
dispute on whether or not that should be a regional vote or if it should be multi multi regions well it's, it's to, to to us in france this is the, the world upside down i mean uh according to the french law if you want to create a union in a in a workplace where there are no unions you simply uh, uh register the the union uh at the uh, what we call prefecture which is a sort of administrative uh, district you know you, you you simply register the union uh with a, a minimum three names one president uh one treasurer and, uh, and and a third one i don't know what a secretary and that's it the union is created and after that it's up to the guys in the workplace to develop the union and convince people to to uh, to join you know uh, even if initially there are three persons uh it's up to the these three persons to 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 convince the others to join it and that's how, how it works uh so you don't have to ask permission uh to to a majority of workers to create the union it's uh, to, to us it seems in, incredible i mean mm -hmm. what I, and what about uh, the retaliation from the bosses how is that well uh, so, well when when you create a union you, you the, the persons who are at the board of the union are protected by the law they can't be fired uh or if they are fired it's uh, extremely difficult for the employer to do so so they they are protected by the law and uh, 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 once you have declared the, the union on the workplace you can organize elections to uh, to elect a, a shop steward i don't know if you use the word in in america uh, it's uh, uh, so and once the shop steward well the, the boss is obliged to uh, allow the election of the shop steward and once the shop steward is elected he is also protected by the law he practically he practically can't can't fire him hmm. yeah in theory that's that's supposed there's supposed to be protection for union organizing here but <clears throat> uh as you could see with the case of amazon and also um starbucks is a big effort right now i've heard about that too yeah there's definitely a lot of retaliation they've even uh been holding mandatory meetings for the workers to convince them that joining a union is bad and things of that nature well th this system in france has been created after long struggles you know uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the, the bosses didn't accept it uh, easily we we've had several general strikes but but really general strike nationwide strikes uh, one in 1936 which gave the workers a two-week paid holiday and uh, after there were other strikes to uh, extend the, the number of uh, the duration of the holiday and there's been another general strike in 1968 uh, which obtained two other uh, two other weeks of uh, paid holidays and now the law is five weeks five paid holidays five weeks a year and in, in some sectors uh, uh, it's even a bit more you know in in the press industry it's eight weeks <laughs> but that's uh due to special negotiations you know mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, these, these holidays you 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 can't you can't exchange uh, uh um for instance say to your boss i won't take my holidays but you give me the money that, that's impossible it's it's it, it's 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 forbidden you, you're right you're obliged to take to take the holidays uh yeah we're there there's been some progress on that uh in america as well since roughly the same times you're talking about um but uh unions union membership and the strength of unions was severely um suppressed uh all throughout the 50s and 60s and um mm -hmm. Once uh, the economic boom was happening, then then it really took a dive, and uh, 
It's just, um, it's been an uphill battle since then. Not that it, it's ever not, but. Um, so what, uh, when did you become an anarchist? What is your story? Well, uh, I, I, I be became an anarchist in 1967. Uh, when I uh, heard about a, a militant called Gaston Levada, okay. and he he published a, a paper, a monthly paper, and I subscribed to the paper, and progressively I I got more and more interested. And uh, at that time, I was a student at the, at the University of Caen in, in Normandy. Caen is a big, 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 big city in Normandy. And when I came to Paris, uh, I joined. I joined his group. He had he had created a a group called the Center of uh, Libertarian Sociology or something like that. Now, and uh, I was a member of his group. And he, his concern, well, he was old at that time already, uh, but he had a incredible history. And uh, his his concern was to form to train militants because he was appalled by the lack of a uh, lack of a uh, training uh, of a uh, theoretical training of the of the militants of the time. So I, I spent several years with other guys in his uh, in his group, and I well, it was very very useful to me afterwards. <laughs> and the, this uh, was a, a deserter in 1914. And he went to Spain and, and joined the CNT, the, the Anarcho-Syndicalist uh, uh, Union. And, and uh, after f fleeing repression, he went to Argentine. And then during the Spanish Revolution, uh, the Civil War, he came back to Spain. I, I forgot. Uh, when, when he was uh, in, in his first stay in, in Spain, he was a delegate to the uh, foundation uh, uh, Congress of the International uh, Labor Unions, which was a, a union uh, equivalent of the Comintern, you know, the International Communist, the Communist International. And it was uh, um, opposed uh, to it, or it was? Well, he, he, his mandate and, and, and other, other militants with him was to observe the situation. And uh, he stayed several months Contrary to many others, he stayed, I think, eight months in, in Russia and met a lot of people. And when, when he came back, he made a report saying that uh, the CNT should not join the, the international labor unions, which, uh, which uh, the, the organization didn't. Uh, so this is probably one of the reasons why the CNT was not later bolshevized because the, all, all the organ, all the trade unions joined the, the uh, who, who supported the Bolsheviks were uh, afterwards uh, controlled by the by the communists. Right, <clears throat> right. Um, well, I'm summing up very briefly, you know, but it's it's the the general trend. <laughs> did, uh, <clears throat> did you have any um, contact with Daniel Gurin? Uh, not sure how that's pronounced, but. <laughs> Yes, briefly. I, I I met him several times, but uh, I wasn't very close to him. Yeah, I'm a little more familiar with with his work. But... Well, I, I know his work, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, you, it's it's uh, you, you can't you can't really be an anarchist in France without knowing Daniel Guerin. <laughs> it's uh, impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Very possible here, though, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I know is um, really confusing when you try to talk about anarchism in, in the uh, United States is the term libertarian. No. And um, it, people don't seem to be aware of the fact that that term has been synonymous pretty much with anarchist, uh, especially in France, pretty much since. Yeah, it's it's the same thing to us. Yeah. 
Well, I think the, 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 the word was coined by a French anarchist who was uh, staying in the States in the 50s, uh, in 1850 or something. And uh, he created the word to, I, I don't, well, I, I don't really know why, m maybe to distinguish uh, anarchism from libertarianism. I don't know exactly, but but he 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 had some some I suppose he had some good reason, maybe because he wanted to dis he wanted to take distances from the word anarchist, which is uh, a bit counterproductive. You know, when you talk to people, uh, it's uh, you know it's shooting a bullet in your foot, you know, as we say in France. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, the problem here now is that there's the Libertarian Party, which is a right wing laissez-faire capitalist party yeah i know yeah and um uh yeah so it's pretty confusing for people you even get you get people saying that libertarian socialism is a contradiction because they just they've read Ayn rand and they have no idea mm -hmm. that these, yeah. the origins and the history um so we have a local group here that's actually trying to form something more along the lines of a syndicalist, uh, well, a, a uh based on the platform. So they're platformist anarchists, and I've been talking to them a little bit. Are you familiar with the platformist approach? Oh, yes. Well, the, uh, the Arshinov platform, you mean? Mm-hmm. Oh uh, yeah, I, I know it. I know it very well. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, well, there's been a lot of fuss made about this platform in France. Uh, the history is a bit uh, complicated because uh, after the Russian Revolution, some some anarchist militants. Uh, ah, in fact, in, during the Russian Revolution, there was a. Uh, a crisis within the, the the anarchist movement and uh, clashes, very violent clashes between anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists. And the, the, the Magnavist movement, uh, when when the, the militants came to France, they 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 wanted to re reform anarchism. Uh, 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 after the failure of the anarchist movement in in, in Russia, mm. so they wanted to re recreate the movement on new bases, and they were absolutely right, because uh, 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 if at that period in the twenties uh, there was a syndicalist movement, a strong syndicalist movement in France. But the, uh, um, uh, um, a substantial part of the anarchist movement was a real catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there, there was a guy called Lorulo uh, in the 20s made conferences uh, in which he explained that uh, the women were the enemies of uh, men because uh, in the anarchist movement they prevented the men from from uh, from being activists hmm. and and he did he, he developed this sort of ideas and there were many people uh, attending to his conferences and and so on that, that was that's the image that a part but a, a sen sensible part of the anarchist movement uh, was and the, these russians wanted to uh, reform the movement but it didn't really work, and uh, s some other Russians, which who, who opposed this platform, created synthesism uh, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, on on other bases, and they wanted to uh, they opposed the platform because they accused it of being Bolshevik and all that. But when you read when you read the document. Uh, the founding document of the platform. It's nothing. It's, well, it's not. It, it's it, a football club is more authoritarian. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, <laughs> you you make a general assembly, you take decisions, and you and, and and you apply the decisions. And that was considered by a part of the anarchist movement in France as Bolshevism, you know, which was right. stupid. 
Uh, and Malatesta was also part of that, right? No, he was he was opposed to uh, platformism. Ah, okay. Um, that's right. Well, he was very touchy about authoritarianism, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a a writer that I met a couple times who uh, is very interested in synthet synth synthesism. Yeah. Uh, his name's Sean Wilbur. I don't know. You might have come across his work because yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's got a uh, he's got a, a a website, I think. Yeah, Libertarian Labyrinth, I think. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know him personally, but uh, I, I know his website. Yeah, eventually I want to get him on here to have a conversation. <laughs> but. <laughs> But the synthesism lies on the idea. Well, in fact, there were two synthesism. One uh, uh, invented, I would say, by by uh, uh, Volin, mm -hmm. and he 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 uh, sincerely wanted to reform the anarchist movement, and he he said that uh, anarchism should integrate uh, the liber liberation of the individual and of the, the the group and make a synthesis of these two uh, but there was another form of synthesis created by another guy Sebastian Faure uh, which was more uh, fanciful I would say and uh, he said that in the organization the anarchist organization there should be three tendencies one an anarcho-communist another uh, syndicalist and a third one, individualist. And they should work uh, in harmony, but that's impossible. I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, even the French Anarchist Federation, which is theoretically uh, synthesis, does absolutely not work on the basis of synthesis. <laughs> absolutely not. It's, they simply say they are synthesis, but uh, it, they, uh, they don't work like that because it's, it's not workable. Um, we lost your video. I'm not sure why. All right. Everything's uh, good on our end again. Okay. So what are you reading and writing about lately? Uh, I, I always write about several things at the same time. And so when I get fed up with one thing, I skip to the other. Yeah. Okay. I'm writing a, a, a mainly about Kropotkin. Um, he's someone I don't like very much, in fact. Do or don't? Uh, 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 maybe I shouldn't say it. Uh, well, he, he says great things, but uh, he irritates me a lot. <laughs> okay. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, there's a debate, more or less formal, about. Uh, whether he is a, a theorist of syndicalism, which which I totally deny, and uh, I'm writing something to explain why I think he is not a theorist of syndicalism. And you would, and, uh, and you, would consider, you would consider yourself mostly a syndicalist, right? Yeah, yeah, or, or an anarcho syndicalist, uh, mm -hmm. which is not well. It's, it's about the same thing, you know. Um, in fact, some, some, or some mainly Anglo-Saxon and uh, Latin American authors want to sort of re recuperate uh, uh, Kropotkin as a theorist of syndicalism. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why, because there's no no reason to insist on that point. I mean, uh, syndicalism doesn't need Kropotkin. Um, and uh, maybe because my my my, my training, uh, my my formation as a as a militant was mainly due to uh, uh, Spanish and Aco syndicalists and uh, old uh, old French syndicalists of the 30s, who were still alive when I started to to be a, uh, an activist in the in the in the late 60s. 
and uh, th these people uh, didn't know Kropotkin. I mean, they uh, yeah. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Kropotkin myself, just because I don't. I don't try to argue from a naturalistic point, and you know, he's such a biologist. He's always arguing from naturalistic. Uh, mm -hmm foundation so well he he he, he, he considers practically uh, anarchism as a science which which is which it isn't i mean right and besides that he he, he founds all his uh, political uh, theory on on the notion of communes and which go back to the uh, communes of the middle ages but the communes of the middle ages have strictly nothing to do with the uh, libertarian communes of now and uh, he he makes uh, he he builds up a, a theory about the, the the communes of the middle ages which were uh, places where freedom was uh, was uh, created against the nobles and all that but it's 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 not that at all and malatesta said that uh, among all, all, all his historical readings, he only retained the parts that uh, confirmed his own positions, you know. And that's what, what Kropotkin does, in fact. Yeah, there's, he's definitely held up as one of the major anarchist figures here as well. And uh, I think part of the reason why is he just seems more palatable. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's much more interesting thinkers. Uh, what else are you working on? Uh, well, practically nothing because, uh, I've been very tired recently, so I, I, I slowed down my work now. <laughs> uh -huh. And, and uh, I, I, I'm having a lot of, uh, uh, exchanges by mail through uh, through the, the internet with uh, people in in Brazil, in Portugal, uh, Spain, and and re more recently the United States uh, and Australia. Uh, I spend quite a lot of time uh, corresponding with these people, and it's very interesting. And this is the first time I'm talking face to face with a with a with an American. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I came across your work uh, just doing my own research on Proudhon and uh, you know some of his philo uh, philosophical views, which uh, he's just now starting to get more attention. There's yeah. in in uh, English, and a lot of it is from authors in the UK. So, well, I, I, I've translated. You know, I, I, I've got a website, and and uh, I translated two chapters. Well, there's a a, 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 a sociologist called Pierre Ansar in France. He's, he's, he died recently, and he was a specialist of Proudhon, and he wrote a book. Uh, entitled uh, Sociology of Proudhon. And I happen to have translated two chapters of this book and, and uploaded uh, them on, on my, my website. And some Americans uh, found these two translations and they decided to finish the translation and translate the whole book. And uh, eventually the book will be published by uh, if I'm wrong, if I'm right, uh, AK Press uh, in next year or the, or the year after, which is a, a very good thing. Yeah. And it seems it seems that there's been a, a, a increasing interest in Proudhon in the states. Yeah, um, mostly I think because of Ian McKay, who did a lot of work on an anarchist FAQ, anarchist fact. Yeah, came out with an anthology of Proudhon's, and so yeah. then there's been more interest. Uh, I think more academics too are researching him. Which, um, yeah, if you 
you uh from what i've read on your work at prudhon there's a lot of um there's a lot of stuff that just isn't considered in english when you when you talk to somebody uh about prudhon he's mostly seen through uh the marxist critique mm -hmm. uh as being someone who uh supported labor uh tokens or labor um you know money based on labor and in a very narrow way just considered uh uh in his role as a mutualist and not so much as uh uh the rest of the issues that he elaborated on well uh, um, in the anarchist movement the the there's a uh, uh, um, do you mind? My, my cat is asking to go out. I, I'll have to, I'll have to t take her outside. <laughs> go ahead. Um, what are some important things you would want people to know about Prudhomme uh, in the United States, considering that? Well, I think um, um, the mutualism. Uh, it's a concept that's been criticized by many anarchists. Uh, you know, with many, many, uh, how would we say, hardcore anarchists. Uh, uh, but it's a mistake, in my opinion, because when you can't make a revolution, you've got to do, you've got to uh, uh, do with uh, the society you're, you're, you're living in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't get, you can't, uh, uh, imagine a revolution every morning while while you put your socks on and say the revolution is today. Right. So uh, w when obviously the revolution is not for today or tomorrow, you must do something. And mutualism is one of the activities the workers can do while waiting for the revolution. And in the in the French uh, working class. Uh, there was the CGT, which was the main union, uh, which was uh, dedicated to class struggle. But at the same time, there were uh, mutual societies. And in fact, uh, I, I consider that the healthcare system of, in France today is in some way uh, something which looks very much like uh, Proudhon's theories. So it's not too bad because the healthcare system in France is not so bad. I, I mean, uh, and, and the, the militants who were doing class struggle uh, during the week in the on the workplace place were active in mutual societies uh, during the weekends, uh, and it's the same thing. The, the, there was no separation between class struggle in the union and mutual mutualist activities dedicated to uh, to 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 uh, education to healthcare and things like that you know and it's a mistake to consider these two activities as antagonistic right i don't know if you see see what i mean i no, exactly and i think that's a mistake a lot of anarchists here make is that they imagine prudhomme's uh ideas to be the end uh that should be aimed for instead of uh just part of the process and the, the, these anarchists say that proudhon uh proudhon uh, uh, imagined that uh, the revolution would be made by the the, the 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 mutual societies of today but it's wrong he said that it was impossible he, he said that the, the, the socialism could be established only by uh, a general uh, upheaval. He, he never said, said that uh, socialism would be created progressively through mutual societies. He, 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 he said the contrary. Yeah, and uh, um, could you maybe explain a little bit of what his ideas were for the People's Bank? and thinking well 
it, it, it's another example of what I was saying that he anticipated things. He he sort of anticipated the healthcare uh, uh, and the social security system of today. And uh, in in his uh, w workers in his uh, popular bank, well, today there are banks in France which uh, uh, whose uh, shareholders are the customers of the bank. There are no, no, you see, it's a sort of cooperative bank where all the uh, members, the, 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 the customers of the banks, uh, uh, participate in general unions, in, in general assemblies to decide the policy of the bank. And this sort of bank, which works today, well, they are quite powerful, uh, is, uh, the, is the sort of thing that uh, Proudhon imagined, which uh, didn't succeed, not because uh, they wouldn't work, but because he was arrested. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but he also wasn't part of his strategy later in his life to try to get um, to taxes to invest in a people's bank. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, he, I believe he joined the government at one point in his life, right? He was elected. And I think one of the things he was trying to do was, uh, use, use, um, government funding to create these banks, right? I know. No, I, I don't think so. He, he was elected at the constituent assembly in 1848. Okay. He was elected, and this is where, uh, in fact, all uh, uh, this is where everything started because he was uh, the only worker, and he he realized that the parliamentary system couldn't do anything for the working class. The uh, parliamentary system was the place where naturally uh, the bourgeoisie takes power. Uh, so this is why he rejected parliamentarism later, and this is the foundation of the anarchist position on, concerning parliaments. Okay. He, 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 never, he, he never said that uh, being elected or electing people is uh, something uh, metaphysically uh, 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 which must be challenged from a metaphysical point of view. It, it was an extremely pragmatical uh, observation, the workers can't, uh, 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 the sovereignty of the working class cannot be exercised in the parliament. Oh, got it. <clears throat> so uh, we also have mutual banks here, but for the most part, they're just commercial banks. Uh, they're not investment banks. The difference being an investment mm. bank uh, will start new companies whereas a commercial bank is just supplying credit, consumer credit. Mm, I see. So what pe people think of when they think of a mutual bank here is just a different place to get a credit card in a lot of ways. <laughs> I see. Um, I personally think that uh, it's a really important idea to try to whether it's called a bank or not, have some sort of working class financial system that could fund uh, new projects. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big hurdles uh, in all types of anarchist organizing in the United States is people are either shy or just... Uh, opposed for inexplicable reasons to having a treasury and collecting dues and doing mm -hmm. anything that would involve money. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a big setback. So that's part of the reason uh, I'm very interested in Prudhon. Uh, and because um, I'm not sure where else uh, those ideas have really been elaborated in anarchist uh, thought. Well, when when he imagined this uh, this bank, uh, it was in 1848. Uh, France was at that time not an industrial country. 
there were uh, few manufacturers and and the greatest part of the economy were small shops, you know, small, small workshops. And his idea was creating this bank to enable uh, uh, individual uh, 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 craftsmen to uh, acquire their tools, which uh, they didn't, which didn't belong to them uh, otherwise. And that's what, that was his idea. Uh, uh, and he was criticized by Marx and Marxist as a, a petit bourgeois uh, theorist because of that. But uh, later on, uh, when, when the, the industrialization of France started, he, he showed that he was uh, incredibly aware of uh, how a uh, uh, financial and speculative uh, economy works. He, he, he wrote a book. Uh, called the uh, Manual of the uh, Speculator at the uh, uh, La Bourse, at the, the, how do you call it? Uh, oh, a, a sort of manual uh, for speculators. Uh, and he wrote this book and, uh, in which he explains how the speculative system, the, uh, the, the capital, uh, uh, speculative capital system works. And it's incredible because he understood everything. And, and when he wrote his system of economic contradictions, he describes the mechanisms of uh, the capital system. That was in 1846, which means that he anticipated a lot of things. Because right. much, much of what he describes didn't exist yet. You know? And he describes the mechanism of the functioning of the capital system incredibly, which was an anticipation 20 years earlier of, of uh, Marx's capital. Yeah, one of the things that you've, well, one of the differences too between Proudhon and Marx is the idea of collective force, which uh, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that argument uh, until very recently, how it was different than the way Marx thought of exploitation. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a really interesting argument that, um, I think is uh, people aren't as inoculated against it as they are when it comes to Marx's idea of exploitation because there's just been so much propaganda from really from the, the right wing mm -hmm. about the idea of the free contract and you know how exploitation can't really exist if you know the contracts are negotiated by individuals freely and this and that mm -hmm. but with the idea of collective force um you really understand uh from a different angle that it's a political decision to decide mm -hmm. what that that um surplus what's done with that surplus on a collective level instead of on an individual level? Well, in, in one of my writings, I explain the difference between Marx and Proudhon, uh, the theory of exploitation. And in the training courses of uh, Marxist groups, they explain that the worker works uh, eight hours a day and uh, during, uh, 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 during uh, six hours, he works for the uh, to uh, produce profit for the work for the, uh, the the capitalist, and for two hours he works for his own pay, and this is this explanation is individual. I mean, right. e e each individual worker works six hours for the boss and two hours for him. So it's it's a bit a bit. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm just uh, summing up roughly. Uh, Proulon's point of view is completely different, and in my opinion, much. Uh, much pertinent. He says that a uh, uh, hundred workers working uh, in a coherent uh, way for a, a capitalist on a workplace produce more in one in one day than a hundred workers producing uh, uh, in one in a hundred. Uh, 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 well, I'll start again. Uh, the, these hundred workers. 
by the collective force, their, their, uh, their combined activity produce much more than each individual worker produces uh, himself. Right. And so the value, the value produced by a hundred workers working together uh, in a combined way is much more important than the value produced individual by a hundred workers. And this is this extra value that the capitalist uh, appropriates. And this explanation seems much more, uh, much more, much better than Marx's uh, explanation. And this is what he means by uh, collective force. You know. uh, he, he gives an example. Uh, there were uh, 200, uh, 200 grenadiers which uh, uh, lifted the obelisk uh, of the Place de la Concorde in Paris in, in one day. But one grenadier would never have done it in 200 days. And right. that's, it's, it's a sort of a, a metaphor, I would say. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I was reading <laughs> reading your essay on that that I even that I even learned the argument. Um, what what was the other um, the other the other thing about Prudhomme is uh, his later work um, on uh, international relations with War and Peace, oh. <laughs> which will eventually be in English uh, sometime in the future. But um, for the past 10 years, maybe 15 years now, there's been a group of academics um, discussing the problem of anarchy in international relations. And that's um, where you see Alex Pritchard mm. and Ruth Kinna uh starting to look to Prudhomme for some of these um perspectives on the question of nationalism really and how it's uh and the impact of nationalism in i guess the world system and uh, i believe that you've you've read war and peace haven't you well n n not not entirely and i, I would say uh, uh, it's a very difficult book to read, uh, and it's not the book I would advise uh, for a beginner. Yeah. Uh, because uh, Proudhon's method consists in uh, in uh, giving you a certain number of arguments, uh, and after a while you imagine that what he thinks. But in the end, it's not what he thinks. He, he explains these arguments thoroughly. And in the end, he uh, contradicts it. And this is what he does in War and Peace. You know, this is why it's a, it's a difficult book to read. But I, I'm not very much acquainted with uh, Proudhon's uh, theories concerning international relations. I, I know he, he wrote, he started a book on, on a theory of property, basing himself on, on the, the situation in Poland. Uh, I don't see very well the relationship, but uh, there seems to be one. And uh, uh, he he uh, uh, he 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 had a quarrel with Bakunin because he said uh, things about the Poles that uh, Bakunin didn't uh, didn't like because he Bakunin had supported the Polish insurrection. Right. But, yeah. He had. Uh, he was a. Uh... Before he was an anarchist, he was a Slavic nationalist, right? And uh, well, Proudhon considered that it wasn't worthwhile. But you know, at that time, there was a great fuss about Poland and the independence of Poland, and people mobilized in favor of the in independence of Poland. And uh, and uh, Proudhon said roughly, uh, "There's no use uh, 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 wasting time about the in the independence of Poland because." Uh, what uh, their situation is largely due to, it's largely th their fault. Poland was a country where there were huge land owners, people, uh, aristocrats who, who owned immense uh, uh, surfaces of land. And uh, the proportion of nobles in this country was out of, uh, 
I mean, uh, in France, there was in, in 18, uh, uh, year, uh, before the revolution, they represented less than 1% of the population. In Poland, they represented 10%, which is uh, absurd, I mean. So he said, there's no, uh, Poland doesn't deserve uh, the French being killed for, their, for its independence. And of course, this offended a lot uh, Bakunin. Uh, he wrote something very harsh about 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 uh, Proudhon because of that, you know. And 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 Bakunin is somebody you've written a lot about as well. Um, and I'm actually not quite as familiar with Bakunin uh, as I am with a lot of other anarchists. But um, one thing that I know people don't seem to understand is Bakunin had his own um, approach to dialectics. I think uh, Bakunin was, uh, was uh, uh, had been trained in, in Hegelian dialectics. Right. Uh, he, studied, he studied philosophy in, in Berlin in, in the 1840s. And he was absolutely crazy about Hegelian philosophy. He was a, a great fan, you know, a bit hysterical. And, uh, but in 1842, he cut, completely cut with philosophy and decided to act. Uh, he, he realized that philosophy was well, not, um, I wouldn't say useless, but was useless, uh, to, uh, useless in action. So, uh, speaking of Bakunin's dialectics, uh, I don't, I don't see the point because he never refers to dialectics in his, uh, in his uh, uh, major works. Hmm. But when you read uh, uh, between the lines, I don't know if you have the expression in English. Yes. When you read between the lines, you realize that philosophy is constantly there, uh, and particularly Hegel, uh, Fichte, Feuerbach. Uh, and even Spinoza, you, 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 these philosophers are constantly present in his writings, but in a sublimin, subliminal, I don't know the word, how do you say, subliminal uh, way. So speaking, I don't see the point talking about Bakun's dialectics, and some, some anarchists say that he was in favor of historical materialism, which is a uh, uh, which is stupid. He, he, he had a, a method, a philosophical method. Uh, he, he called it uh, scientific materialism. If you, want to, if you want to attribute a method to Bakunin, uh, this is the one he uh, refers to explicitly. And uh, his method was an uh, uh, experimental method. De definitely the experimental method. He never refers to a dialectical method, which was to him something like a metaphysics, you know. Right. He, he is absolute, like Proudhon, as Proudhon, you know, and, and Kropotkin, all, all the main anarchist authors were uh, in favor of exper experimental method, which is the, the, the basic scientific method used in every science. Um, can you explain a, a little bit to whoever's going to watch this about the way that Prudhone uh, anticipated, well, was criticized by Karl Marx for his method, and then Karl Marx later adopted the same method when he wrote Capital? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, when Proudhon wrote uh, his system of economic uh, contradictions, he, he, he started wondering how he would manage to explain the mechanisms of uh, the capital system. And he, he said, uh, well, when should we start? He wanted, he, he thought he could do it from a historical method, you know, and he said, when should we start? I mean, uh, in 16th century, the antiquity, uh, well, and eventually he realized that it was impossible to explain the mechanisms of the capitalist system uh, through history. 
So he imagined a logical explanation, and he imagined uh, uh, categories. He said uh, all the categories of the uh, uh, capitalist system work together. So you have to choose one, and the one you choose must be the essential and fundamental category of the system. And he came to the conclusion that the fundamental category of capitalism was value. So he started explaining value, and from value he deduced, uh, he, 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 he says, he, uh, he uses the word, I made a, a scaffolding, which today you would say, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, I don't know the word, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, this scaffolding was uh, starting from value and then deducing uh, all the other categories of the system, uh, co uh, uh, competition, uh, uh, concentration of capital, uh, monopoly, etc. And all these categories were derived from the fundamental uh, category. And when Marx read this book, he criticized uh, Proudhon hysterically saying that he was a metaphysician and a petit bourgeois and all, all these sorts of things. Uh, he, he made a very harsh criticism of, uh, of uh, Proudhon's method, which was nothing but uh, exper experimental method, method that is uh, hypothetical de deductive method. Uh, it's the word we use in French, I don't know. And, and, and after that, he said, I'm going to show you how, 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 how I, we, I explain the system. And during 10, 20 years, he didn't publish anything because he didn't, he didn't manage. And there's a letter he wrote to Engels uh, 10 or 15 years later. He said, uh, well, I can't do it. I can't find how, how to do it. Uh, I'm in the a, in a dead, dead end, you know. And, uh, and finally, when he published uh, Capital, he explained his method in in uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the preface, or I, or I think. And what he explains is exactly what Proudhon had had done, done 20 years earlier. And he he said, "I use categories and so on." While 20 years earlier, he he he, he criticized uh, Proudhon for ma uh, referring to categories. And when you see the plan, the the the. the uh, of, of capital, you realize this is roughly the same as a system of economic contradiction. He starts with value and so on, and all the other categories derived are roughly the same as Proudhon. And uh, uh, so he, he tries to explain this change in his method, how he discovered his new method. And he said, I incidentally uh, leafed through uh, Hegel's uh, uh, logic and found the method. And strangely, this book he's supposed to have leafed through had be, had had belonged to Bakunin. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's yeah. That's amazing. So this, you know, everything is intertwined. You know, it's, uh, when you say there's no no uh, rapprochement between Marxism and anarchism, it's wrong because the uh, things are completely intertwined in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really important part of the history of uh, anarchism and Marxism that. Uh, Marxists would love if it didn't exist, and a lot too many anarchists don't even realize it. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about more recent times, uh, because so a lot of American anarchists have the idea that uh, anarchism practically didn't exist um, after after the 1950s all the um, well after World War II and all the way until 1968 and then 1968 uh, led to a, a resurgence of anarchist thinking and uh, just from you talking about your own background it sounds like that's not quite true. And so I'm really interested in what was going on with anarchism basically in that time period between uh, World War II and 1968. 
Well, I'd be tempted to say that during this period, uh, anarchism practically disappeared, but uh, it, 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 it exists in, in the form of, uh, in the form of uh, anarcho-syndicalism. Um, the anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist movement was uh, practically exterminated uh, during the war. Hmm. Uh, but... Uh, and when you say that, you mean in a very material way, not just... Yeah, no, very, very uh, expressly. Uh, it's not an image, I mean. Right. The, 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 the casualties of the Spanish anarchist movement were enormous. Several hundreds of thousands of, uh, of men and women. And... Uh, the same thing was in Latin America uh, during the period uh, uh, after after the war. Uh, uh, the, the, there were dictatorships in Latin America which uh, which were practic practically wiped out the the anarchist movement, but uh, small groups still still remain, and uh, many many uh, many militants uh, were active in in the in the working class in the trade unions. Sometimes not not as uh, an anarcho syndicalist, but uh, uh, anonymously, but still there, you know. Right. And uh, uh, so, so this explains why why the movement didn't didn't disappear. And uh, well, when I was I, I started uh, my uh, activity as an as as an anarchist in in France, at least there were many old men and women. Uh, who, who were anarchists or anarcho syndicalists uh, They were very active, and they were quite numerous. I mean, uh, su survivors, uh, survivors because uh, they were old enough to. Well, they were old, but also because they escaped uh, repression during the war. Uh, the movement. I think that you you can't exterminate completely the, the anarchist movement because the. When in 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 the most terrible periods, they simply disappear underground and reappear when the circumstances are favorable. Right. And yeah, and then uh, I don't want to cover. Well, and then so what were anarchists doing uh, in 1968? Because a lot of what we hear about is with the Situationist International, and. Um, uh, we don't really learn a whole lot about what anarchists were doing at that time in France. Well, I, I, I must say that in France, the anarchist movement was not uh, not very uh, uh, very efficient. Uh, they they uh, they were not up to the expectations uh, people might have had uh, for them. And they, but the, after the after the general strike, they decided to reorganize, and a certain number of uh, groups were created to uh, compensate the the deficiency the, the deficiencies of the anarchist movement during this period. Hmm. Um, also, some group like some groups like. Uh, uh, Organisation Révolutionnaire Anarchiste uh, and so on. Uh, another group called Alliance Syndicaliste. Uh, well, the names don't, don't mean anything to uh, to, the, to you Americans, but there were small groups which were created in in view of reorganizing the movement on a more uh, rational basis and and more efficient basis. And this is where you when Gaston Laval. Uh, was doing a lot, right? Is that correct? Well, the problem is uh, not many not many activists were part of his group, but uh, uh, it is true that at one moment some comrades and me decided to leave him to uh, create a group called uh, Syndicalist Alliance, and uh, Gaston uh, uh, he told us, "But you're not ready. You're not ready." And uh, we 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 told him, well, someday we'll have to leave you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, he was sorry. I mean, it was a uh, you know, it was a bit of a bit like a father, you know, an uh, uh, intellectual father for us. And 
I personally owe enormously to Gaston Le Verne. Uh, he, he was a, a very strong character, you know. He, 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 uh, he had an apartment near Montparnasse in Paris. Uh, and his, his flat was full of books piled up on the floor, you know, and, and on the shelves. And uh, there used to be a lot of people coming to visit him, people, uh, old, old magnavists, uh, uh, old, old revolutionaries from Spain and, and so on, and all Latin America. He, he spoke, uh, he spoke uh, Spanish, of course. And uh, so, so there were a lot of people visiting him. And at that time, we were young and we didn't, we didn't imagine and these people had been part of history. You know, they were just guys. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a, a man called uh, Marcel Body, who, who was uh, uh, enlisted in uh, uh, in the First World War, and he deserted. He was sent to uh, as a as an expeditionary corps in in Russia uh, to f fight against Bolshevism, and he deserted. And he joined the Bolshevik Party, and he ended up as a as a, a, a member of the Communist International. Hmm. And uh, so he met everybody, Lenin, uh, Trotsky, and so on. And when when I first met him, I didn't realize such a man, what a man he was, you know. And we realized much later. And uh, he spoke about Lenin because he had talked to him, you know, Trotsky or Alexandra Korontai, or so on. And uh, it's it's in some way people of my generation. I, I'm 75. We're a, a, a intermediate generation between the young generation of today, who uh, and and the one who had physical contacts uh, with uh, old militants of the of the 20s and 30s, and who have all disappeared today, of course. Yeah. And, I uh, and to us, it was something normal. I mean, we didn't realize how, how incredible it was to meet men like uh, this Baudin and so on, and or Gaston Leval, who, who had fought during the, the Civil War, who, who had been arrested in France, escaped, and, uh, uh, and so on. You know, it's uh, uh, incredible. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I think my generation is sort of an in-between generation as well. For whatever's going to happen next. Um, well, in the States, you've got men like Sam Dolgoff and so on, uh, which which were great figures, I mean. Right. Yeah, or Paul Goodman, or uh, there's a lot of, yeah. I'll, and yeah, I, I really think that it's sort of similar to, to back then as far as the uh, being in between. Well, hopefully, I'm between something. I hope there's something after this. But, um, what a so in your recent work uh where you're critiquing the uh muslim anarchism you mentioned the new social movements and no. that's something i've read a lot about because sartre uh also um started to discuss the new social movements as the future of what revolutionary organizing would look like. And it seems like that's incorrect. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, a lot, and they've, the new social movements really have been easily recuperated mm -hmm. and uh, brought into the, uh, just being part of uh, the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what, if you could elaborate a little bit more on on what that whole uh, phase of history and working class history has been like. Well, there's been a, a small crisis recently in, in France in the anarchist movement because there was there was a, a, a well, there is still is a, a, an anarchist organization. Uh, which uh, no, normally should have been platformist, and suddenly uh, a substantial number of uh, activists uh, 
left the organization. And uh, these, these people were, uh, I would say, old timers. I mean, uh, veterans of the, of, the, of the movement, which had a, a union activity and, and political and working, and, and working class activity. And they opposed to the others who were, uh, I would say, woke. <laughs> and, yeah. they were, and they were fed up of the wokes in, in their organization and they left. So this is about the situation of the, of the, the anarchist movements in France. And uh, I, I don't know if the ones who left, whom I know, uh, because I, some of them are my generation, I don't know if they will create another organization, but I don't think so. Well, that's, that, that's the point. And, and uh, th there's a, a part of the anarchist movement who are absolutely fed up with the woke uh, argumentation, uh, argumentation and, and, and the behavior, They're really fed up, you know. Uh, the, the, uh, and, uh, well, uh, my opinion about post-anarchism is that it's, it's an ir irrelevant uh, concept. There's no pre or post anarchism. There's anarchism. Uh, I, I don't deny that anarchism has to be updated uh, because society uh, evolves and changes and mutates and all that. And so the, 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 the movement must evolve and adapt. But there's no point make, imagining a post anarchism. And, and those who refer to it, and, the, and for instance, those of what what you call in, in the States the French theory, <laughs> uh, they, they strictly didn't know anything about anarchism. Yeah, are, uh, it's surprising how little they knew about it. Yeah, so, so I don't know why, why they chose to, call, to, to, to use the word, the expression post-anarchism. Uh, and this is what I say in my text about this, uh, this uh, anarcho-Islam, you know, which is stupid. I mean, uh, anarchism is atheist. If, if you're not atheist, you can you can be whatever you want. Uh, it's absolutely your right, but you can't you can't be anarchist. I mean, <laughs> right? Agreed. Um, yeah, one of the an, another thing that I think mirrors France, um, maybe in an earlier period, but what's happening in the United States is when. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of new philosophers like Raymond Aron? And um, yeah. I think there's uh, there's a lot of younger people now who are becoming more like Raymond Aaron and that kind of uh, internationalist liberal and less like um, the woke stuff. And well, Raymond Aron is, in my opinion, is a great thinker. It's he's a, he's a, much more interesting than all, all, all these guys are uh, claiming uh, French philosophy. You know, mm. uh, I, uh, well, he he is he he, he is right wing, but uh, 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 he is intelligently right wing. Oh yeah. And, uh, I'm a bit like Bakunin, uh, so to speak. <laughs> uh, he he. He respected opponents, people he, he didn't agree with, if if they could uh, uh, support their argumentation and their thought, uh, uh, and he respected them. He he didn't re he despised mediocre uh, people, and uh, uh, in my opinion, people uh, uh, thinkers like Raymond Aron is, is a great thinker, a great philosopher. Yeah, I think I think he so. If instead of uh, post anarchism, I think one of the ways anarchists could be updating their theory is by looking at people like Raymond Aaron and recognizing that this is a growing uh, perspective uh, ever since you know the '90s, especially with the fall of you know the Soviet bloc, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of where anarchists could use a lot of improvement, which actually ties back to the whole uh, interest in international relations. And um, well, yeah, go ahead. 
No, this didn't occur to me, but maybe you're right. I'll have to I'll have to read Raymond Aron again. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and it's also partly. Uh, I don't I don't know what your thoughts are on Jean Paul Sartre, but obviously it's someone who was uh, constantly uh, in competition with Raymond Aron. I think he's interesting in that regard as well. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't. I, I don't have much uh, much uh, consideration for Jean Paul Sartre. He was, a, to me, he was a a, a, a companion of the Communist Party, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people who supported the Communist Party so so much at that time were uh, well prove the lack of intelligence and and, and, and the great lack of insight. Yeah. You know, well, that's what I think. Well, uh, same thing with Simone de Beauvoir, although she wrote things or books which were very, very interesting, like uh, The Second Sex and so on. But, but uh, fundamentally, she, he, she and, uh, and Sartre were companions we, in French, we say compagnon de route, uh, companions of the of the Communist Party. Yeah, I think in English it gets translated to fellow traveler. Ah. <clears throat> um, what about Albert Camus? Well, I, I'm not very familiar with him, but uh, he's much closer to the libertarian movement. Right. And. Uh, uh, he he and Gaston Leval had contacts, you know, they knew each other. Yeah, uh, that's, and that's, uh, I feel like something that gets overlooked. There's a, there's been a lot of revival of people reading Albert Camus, especially since COVID-19 and his work, The Plague. And mm. uh, even before yeah. then, there is a, whole month where he was celebrated in New York. And I think there was a big thing in uh, France as well. And for all of that, you know, you'd think they would come upon the fact that he uh, was very, uh, he collaborated with a lot of anarchists uh, yeah. during his life. Yeah. But no. <laughs> um, well, Unfortunately, I do have to get uh, get to my work and everything, but uh, maybe, you know, do you want to do another interview that would be more structured and we could discuss some things uh, of interest? Well, I don't know. It's up to you. Okay. It's up to you if you, if you can make out something with, uh, with uh, our conversation t tonight. It's okay, but if there are more questions or more things you would like to discuss, uh, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, I, would so like, I think I would like to just take maybe one or two of uh, the essays that you um, you really uh, think are some of your most important ones and talk about those specifically. Okay. Well, in, the, in that case, you just send me a mail so that I can, you know, prepare uh, and uh, be be more thorough in my in my discussion. I mean, if, if there are a few points you want me to develop, I mean, okay, yeah, just, just to tell me beforehand so I can think about it. Sure, yeah, that would be great. Okay. And then just, I didn't ask this at the beginning, and I should have. Your name is Rene. Uh, yeah. Is that your pen name, or? It's my official name. Okay, because when I when I Google search it, there's someone who's famous, uh, an actor or something with the same. Oh name. yeah, well, there's a there's an uh, an actor called Rene Berthier, and there's a. A, a famous Jesuit father who's was called Rene Libertier also. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't. Yeah. So was a little he wrote a lot of books for for children, so, so Jesus and the children and all that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not okay. me. <laughs> okay. Well, 
All right. Well, yeah, I'll put this up on YouTube probably tomorrow. And uh, I'll just take out the parts where we were. Uh... It's a bit long, no? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the normal length of the ones I do. It's okay. yeah, the average. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I'll have a look then. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks to you. It was a, you enabled me to practice a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Okay. Well, bye-bye and thanks a lot. All right. Have a good evening. Bye.